So welcome. Uh, it's fantastic to be here in the open. This is quite a. Is this the sound of the echoing? It's pretty echoing. Okay. Okay, that's good. All right. Perfect. Okay, it's wonderful to be here at the Open Source Summit. I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you today about a technology we think is really important for developers uh, about building long-running fault-tolerant applications. Um, we'll be talking to you a lot about Dapper workflows. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves first. Uh, my name is Mark Fussell. I'm the CEO of Diagrid. Um, I'm one of the original co-creators of the Dapper Open Source Project. Uh, we'll be talking about Dapper quite a bit and what that is. Um, and the role of Diagrid itself is as a company is to boost developer productivities, uh, particularly focusing on developing APIs and tools for developers who build you know, distributed applications, particularly those in sort of the cloud native space. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Uh, my name is Kendall Roden. And as Mark said, we're both from Diagrid. I am one of the product managers at Diagrid and super excited to jump into workflows today and show you a couple of great demos. Um, super cool. Happy to be here. So let's frame the discussion, uh, because it's always really important to think about the problem space. Um, so really what happens today is you, know, you as developers, you're building the, these large scale or even small scale applications that are distributed in nature. And here we have a sort of a fictitious e-commerce application. You know, and when you look at one of these, on the f uh, uh, when you first inspect it, it kind of seems pretty straightforward. Create some processes, you've got an inventory application, you've got an email application, you know, put them all together. But as you get under the covers, there's many, many challenges that developers have to deal with. How do I discover other services I communicate with? How do I send messages between them all? How do I manage some of the secrets that I want to uh, coordinate to talk to resources like databases? And one of the ones that's sort of like the hidden thing sometimes is how you actually coordinate across those services. How is it that I call one service, you know, schedule the next? If there's a failure with those, how do I kind of backtrack and do some of the compensation around this? And before you know it, most developers and most line of business applications are writing some sort of workflow. And that means that they tend to kind of stitch together queues and cron jobs and all sorts of things around this all. And so the reality is that many, many applications have a workflow-like concept in them, whether it's a healthcare application, an HR onboarding application, you know, some uh, thing that just signs you up to a financial accounts. So your know, workflow tends to be central to a distributed application. Um, but of course, a distributed application has many problems in itself in order to solve. As we look at workflow, kind of workflow kind of materializes itself in many, many forms. Um, and in the end, it's a form of sequence of tasks and activities that you want to put together to achieve a business goal. You know, whether that business goal is an HR onboarding system or a financial system. So it literally appears everywhere, from manufacturing systems to financial systems. So you know, it's crucial to most business applications. Now, you know, as a developer, you're thinking, well, how do I build all of these applications? How do I you know, deal with all of these problems that you know, we talk about. And many of the times, you know, you're told to go off and read a set of documentation, understand how that works. Well, this is where Dapper, or the Distributed Application Runtime Open Source Project comes in. Its goal is to make you developers you know, much more productive in building applications. And its focus is to you know, stop you having to repeat the same old patterns, but codify the best practices for how you build those applications into a set of libraries and APIs that you can use to build your applications on top of, whether that's running on a set of VMs or whether that's running on Kubernetes or whatever your choice of platform is. So Dapper is kind of a key project that we started many, many years ago because we understood the developer challenges that were there. Now, what it does is it's pretty straightforward. It gives you a set of APIs that you can leverage over HTTP or gRPC. You can come at this from any language of your choice. You can be a Go developer, a Node developer, a .NET developer. You know, it doesn't, really doesn't matter. There's a set of libraries or SDKs to help you do that. And what it provides is an API in order for you to build these distributed applications. So for example, say you wanted to communicate between two applications. It has an API called service to service invocation. The role of that allows you to talk from one application to another. It allows you to do it securely. It does the discoverability for you. It does retries. It does all the heavy lifting on your behalf. Or say you want to create long-running stateful applications. It has a concept of state management through key value storage. And you can store, say, the state of a shopping cart or a gaming session state inside that API. So these APIs allow you as a developer to focus on business logic, you know, leading, leaving the difficult implementation of building distributed applications to Dapper, the open source project. The project has been hugely successful. 
It was launched uh, a few years ago, about well, three and a half years ago, grown to be a large, diverse, contributing community, um, and it's part of CNCF. In fact, it's the 10th largest project inside CNCF. So what we're focusing on this today is that as part of the earlier release this year, in January, we released 1.10 version of Dapper, and as part of that, we included the workflows. The workflows is now being kind of this key technology because we recognize that developers needed the workflow engine to satisfy many of their business needs that they were, you know, to create their distributed applications. Now, looking a little bit under the covers about how Dapper works, I strongly suggest that you go and listen to a talk that happened yesterday and was recorded about the Dapper 101 that dived into this deeper and talked about what Dapper did. But what it does is it runs as a sidecar to your application. So effectively, you run your application. Every instance of your application that runs has a Dapper sidecar that runs next to it all. It does all the heavy lifting on your behalf. You simply call an API. So in this case, say you wanted to call the order application of the, the order method on the cart application, wherever it's running. Dapper will do that for you with a simple API call here that allows you to discover where that application is, call it, and does, say, retry security, everything on your behalf. Straightforward, easy to understand as a developer, makes your code concise, consistent, and portable about this because the portability you know, is independent of the platform it runs on. So there is a suite of these APIs. Uh, we particularly today, as I said yesterday, if you go back to the talk, they covered service invocation, they covered pub sub inside that. We today are going to focus and dive down deep into workflows. It's a new API that we've introduced. You'll see it evolve over the rest of this year. Um, but it's also very powerful in terms of what you can do today. And we're going to show you demos around all this, how you can use it all. Um, and then our goal is that you can go away, try this out, and then really get into the Dapper community and give us feedback about how this can be improved, how it satisfies some of your business needs, and where to take it all. So with that, I'll let Kendall dive in. Yes, OK, thanks, Mark. Let's give it up for Mark. <laughs> Woo. I know, we're at the end of the day. I get it. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. So who's ready to learn about Dapper workflows? OK, awesome. You're some of the first people that are hearing about this feature, because as mentioned, it's pretty much brand new in alpha. So this is the first talk we've done on Dapper workflows. So I uh, hope that excites you a little bit to get into the meet here today. So we talked about what a workflow is in general, right? A business process that has a series of activities or tasks that we want to execute in a particular order. Uh, and in a lot of cases, those processes may be manual. But in the case of Dapper workflows, it's pretty much the exact same thing, except, it's except we're bringing it to the software-defined level, right? So we're essentially saying it's a sequence of software-defined tasks or activities that are executing in a particular order to accomplish a particular business goal. So here you'll see the first quick overview. I really want to emphasize Dapper workflows are written with um, workflow SDKs that we provide. So essentially, you're building a microservice. And within that microservice, you're defining a workflow in your application code. So let's dive a little bit more into some of the features and functions of, of Dapper workflows. So the first thing I want to touch on is activities, which we talked about, really the basic unit of orchestration that this workflow will have. Uh, you write activities as small bits of business logic within your application code. And this is where all of the computation and you know, external calls are happening that are being orchestrated by the parent workflow. Workflows also have a capability called durable timers. And this really shows that workflows are extremely durable and resilient. So if you've worked with workflows before, you don't want necessarily a super arbitrary timeout, right? That workflow could take 30 days, even a year, to complete. Uh, so a good example of how you could use a durable timer is within a workflow, you could actually say, hey, uh, you know, my product has a 30-day subscription period, and I want this workflow to trigger after 30 days and essentially kick off the workflow to, you know, end that person's trial period. So it's pretty impressive. It can offload itself from memory for those whole 30 days, uh, storing its state, and then basically coming back alive after that specified duration. Uh, so really, really uh, powerful capability there. Child workflows are really interesting because you see the, the value of this when you're running at scale. So basically, the way that Dapper workflows work is that they're storing the state of the workflow's progression in a, uh, an append-only log. And if you're running a Dapper workflow that's executing you know, tens of thousands of tasks, you can imagine that that history, when a workflow is replaying itself and reloading itself from, uh, from memory, uh, will take a lot of execution power. So if you're running at scale and you're executing a lot of tasks, you might want to actually spawn off a child workflow, which essentially has its own instance ID, maintains its own history, those sort of things. 
And then last but not least, another really cool capability is that very likely in a workflow, you might have something that requires manual intervention or some type of payload to be received in order to trigger another activity. So you can use external events to essentially do this. So imagine you're in the middle of a HR provisioning workflow for a new hire's onboarding, and you actually need to have a manual uh, you know, step where somebody goes and assigns a particular machine to a user or approves a, um, an order for a machine. You can actually have your workflow wait until an event come back, comes back that this activity has been completed. So the reason I put a star here is this isn't in the current alpha implementation, um, but it is already planned and in progress. Awesome, is this making sense? Are we tracking, still with me? Okay, cool. So we're gonna jump right into a demo. I wanted to try to bring a demo up to the front. This is the first demo of the day. We will have another. But I just wanna essentially break down some of those core features into a really simplistic demo that shows you what it looks like from a code perspective. So today I'm using the .NET SDK to author my workflow with Dapper. Um, that's what's supported today. Python in progress coming this month. And then we're working on things like Java, JavaScript, and extended capabilities uh, from, a, from a code language perspective. So if we take a look at this workflow, we have an application that's essentially called the Hello World microservice that contains a Hello World workflow. Uh, we wanna kick off that workflow somehow, right? And the way that we can actually instantiate an, an instance of a workflow is by using the uh, management APIs, essentially. So you can see here, Mark showed a great slide earlier that talked about the simplicity of Dapper APIs, and this is just a further example of that. We can see V1 Alpha 1 because it's an alpha API. We're using the Dapper wor workflow engine, which is specified here in our URL. We're telling it which workflow we want to instantiate, and we're passing in a unique ID. Uh, what's cool about each workflow is that it has its own instance ID, and because this is part of a business process, it's really easy to essentially use business entities to make these um, unique ins instance IDs valuable, right? So think about like an order service. You might want to use the order ID or the instance ID to represent that order. Uh, so super easy, you can generate that in your code. And in this case, we're essentially gonna kick off that workflow. We give it simple input and a simple output. So all workflows expect to receive an input and uh, return a single object as a result. So in this case, we're passing in a name. Um, we're gonna pass it into a particular activity. In this case, the workflow only has one activity, so super simple. And then we're essentially going to return a string as the output value, which is just going to be the name plus a particular greeting that we generate. So, okay, let's dive into the code. Okay, so let's kick it over here. Um, can you see the screen? Okay, let me zoom in a little bit. How's that looking? Can you see okay? A little bit more? A little bit bigger, okay. So what I'm gonna show you now is a couple of important things that you'll have to do to actually get your code up and running using this workflow authoring SDK. Uh, so the first thing that we'll see is that we have to include the Dapper client and the Dapper workflow library. So these are essentially just saying, hey, include the authoring SDK capabilities and include a Dapper client that I can use to make use of the Dapper APIs and invoke that sidecar that my, Mark talked about. If we look at the program.cs, and once again, this is all in .NET, um, we can see that we're adding the Dapper workflow service, and in that, what we have to do is register the workflow itself and any activities that will be kicked off within this program. So in this case, we're registering the Hello World workflow, and we're essentially registering a single activity called the uh, Create Greeting activity. So if we take a look at the, the, uh, the workflow itself, it's really basic, right? We can see it inherits from this workflow base class, and essentially the string input and string output are specified. Um, it receives the workflow context, which is essentially used to do things like creating durable timers, kicking off child workflows, uh, scheduling activities, and then we take an input, which is what we're going to post, uh, you know, a name. And then we can see here that we're essentially awaiting the call activity method. What this is going to do is essentially send in the name um, to the create greeting activity and return us a string. And then we're gonna finish the workflow. Sounds pretty simple, yeah? You wanna see it? Okay, I'm gonna show you. All right, so what we do to run the Dapper application itself, so my uh, like Dapper workflow, uh, the Hello World app, along with the Dapper sidecar, is we can do that in a single command. So I'm gonna do a Dapper run. I'm gonna assign an app ID, which is essentially a unique ID that Dapper uses to identify your application workload. So in this case, it'll be Hello World. And then in addition, I'm gonna pass in the app port. So this is basically just saying, hey Dapper, my application's running on port 5000. My application knows that the Dapper sidecar is running on port 3500, and then I'm passing in the command to actually kick off my app, which is .NET Run. So let's kick this off. I'm gonna make this bigger for everyone so you can see what's going on. 
And really the important thing to note is that when you see the, uh, the blue text here, um, that's my application logs. And when you see the text that says info, that's actually coming from the Dapper sidecar. So all of that's just vi visualized to me because I ran both in a single command. And the main thing I wanna call out here is that we see the app has connected to the sidecar and that the sidecar has started the workflow engine. So those are really the big things to call out. So now we're going to invoke this Hello World um, application. And how are we going to do that? Well, we have to instantiate an instance of the workflow. So we're using that workflow management API that I showed on the previous slide, and we're passing in input is Kindle, which is my name. <laughs> and now I'm gonna send the request. Sound good? Y'all ready to see what happens? What greeting am I gonna get back? We don't know. So I'm gonna send the request. Um, I see I got a 202 accepted, and it returned the instance ID of the workflow. And then I'm essentially going to use a secondary command, which you see down here. I'm invoking the status of that workflow. So I wanna retrieve and basically pull the status, which is what I'm doing here. So I'm sending in that instance ID. And I can see here that my, we'll close this, my workflow runtime status is completed, which means that the workflow ran successfully. And you can see that my input was Kindle and the output is high Kindle. Unfortunately, got the most boring greeting that there was, mm -hmm. too bad. Um, but essentially, I could run this you know, multiple times. I could even reuse the instance ID and overwrite the, uh, you know, the historical data there. Um, I can spin off a new workflow with a new GUID. Um, I could even run these sequentially and essentially wait for the output to return. So while this is using a sequential flow, um, I could also do a multitude of workflow patterns like uh, fan out, fan in. I could use sequential. I could do monitor patterns. So there's a lot of different patterns you can code that are all supported by Dapper workflows. Okay, cool. So that was fun, but not that exciting. So why don't we get a little bit more advanced, okay? So before we do that, I kind of want to dive into some of what you just saw and demystify some of the logs that you probably are like, okay, you, that was a black box to me. So let's dive into that. I can do this. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the Dapper sidecar, and I just wanna call out here that the Dapper workflow engine is running inside of that Dapper sidecar. So your Dapper workflow engine, the main thing to note here is that it manages and schedules your workflows and your activities. It does not execute them, right? All of the executions taking place within the workflow that you've created in your application code. Um, another thing to consider is that the Dapper engine also stores and maintains state. So I know I've talked about this append-only log, um, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like. But essentially, you have to imagine a workflow gets scheduled, um, and activities are getting scheduled, and then the workflow engine needs to know, hey, have these completed, su have these completed successfully. And they also need to be able to replay the state if and when the workflow ever needs to rerun or if one of the services goes down. So I'll show you what that looks like as well. Uh, another thing to consider is that if you're running at scale, we talked about you know, practices like uh, child workflows. There's also something called continue as new, where you can essentially have a workflow restart itself with a new instance ID and a new history. Um, but those kind of things go well into execution at scale. And if you are executing at scale, running across multiple um, you know, virtual machines, the engine will actually load balance the tasks and activities across these machines. Um, so let's focus on the workflow part. So we've talked about the Dapper workflow authoring SDK, um, but what does the workflow actually do? It's a definition, right? It's telling the workflow engine, these are the activities I wanna run, and these are the orders I wanna run them in. And what's important too is that the workflow itself doesn't execute any type of computation. It's not making any external service calls to other microservices. It's delegating all of that to the activities. So that's really important to, to keep in mind. And it also behaves deterministically. So it expects that the uh, same input will always result in the same set of actions being executed. So this is why it's really important. Imagine I kick off a workflow, it's a long running workflow, and then I make a modification to the code and push it, right? That can be very challenging because it might change the historical log whenever an existing workflow instant, instance replays itself. So you really wanna version your workflows, so v1, v2, when you're making changes to activities and things that are going to change the execution history if it was to replay. Um, what's really neat here is you'll see a line going between these things. So when, the work, when your workflow basically, when you're, you, know, you start the runtime of your application or you're you know, uh, creating a runtime instance, it will actually use a gRPC stream and it will initiate that gRPC stream to the Dapper sidecar. So the Dapper sidecar isn't calling into your app or you know, using an API to hit your app on a particular endpoint. Instead, it's using this gRPC stream that's initiated from your application by the authoring SDK. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in that gRPC stream to actually make sure that the workflow is running. Um, so we can see here, we've got that initiated gRPC stream from your application code. 
And what it's first doing is essentially getting a series of commands or management uh, you know, capabilities or, or command execution steps from the engine, right? So it's gonna say things like schedule this workflow, schedule this activity on behalf of this particular workflow instance. Um, in order to be able to track the state of completion, then your application code will be reporting back the results of this, right? So it's all, I'm telling you what to do, the application code is executing and returning the results. That makes sense? I'm gonna wait just a second because people are taking some pictures, so. Okay, awesome. Do you wanna see a more advanced example? <laughs> Okay, that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna put together all those concepts we just talked about. So we have our Dapper workflow engine or our Dapper sidecar. We know that there's gonna be that gRPC stream initiated and I'll show you this in, in the logs as well. And this time we're actually gonna have a, I want you to think about it more from a retail perspective. So imagine this is a single microservice called the checkout microservice. And within that particular microservice, we have a particular workflow that handles receiving, think of it as like a basket or like a checkout, right? So let's imagine a user has already gone through the process of curating what they want to order and we're basically receiving that order payload and executing the checkout process. So within that, we no longer have one activity like the Hello World one, but we have five. And not all of these, ac these activities will execute every time, but they are deterministic in that if we get a particular input, the output will always follow the same path, right? And that comes into compensating transactions. So we'll talk a little bit about when a particular activity would fire versus when it would not. So we're gonna kick this workflow off the same way we did with the previous workflow, except we're now changing the name from Hello uh, World Workflow to Checkout Workflow, and we'll obviously pass in a new unique instance for uh, the workflow itself. And then the input I'm passing in is gonna be more like an order payload. So I'm gonna take in a name, an email, and then an, a particular order item. And in this case, uh, we, I just made it uh, conference tickets. So if you wanted to buy you know, 50 tickets to KubeCon or 20 tickets to the OSS Summit. Make sense? Business context all there? Okay, cool. I'm gonna switch over. Um, go ahead and let's do a quick to the demo gods and hope that everything works out because it's a little more complex than the previous. Okay. Let me make sure this code is all good. I'm gonna stop this just so we don't have you know multiple things happening. Okay. So right now we are dropped into a retail application which has two services. Now imagine this is obviously multiple services. We might have a shipping service, a fulfillment service, uh, the list goes on. But in this case, we're gonna focus specifically on checkout and payment. So in this checkout service, I've done everything I showed in the previous slide, right? I've already registered my workflows, I've registered my activities, and now I'm authoring a workflow. Now, and, and is, this, is this zoomed in enough? Can you see the, the content okay? Okay, cool. So the big thing here that you'll notice is that I'm no longer like taking in a string and sending out a string, right? I've created entities or classes that I expect to receive an output. So in this case, we take in a customer order, which is that payload in the post, and then we're going to return a checkout result. And in this case, the checkout result is very simple. It's a processed flag that's either true or false. It was either processed or not. Uh, so we can see here I'm using the instance ID that I received from that uh, management command to set an order ID, which is really nice because once again, it's creating business context for us to say this particular workflow is tied to a particular order ID. Uh, the first, and can we just make some, make some noise for Mark that he's still standing here? <laughs> I know he's probably like, I don't want to sit down. And you're welcome to, Mark, if you want. But uh, the first thing we're going to do is essentially use an activity that just notifies uh, the client that, hey, we received an order and we're going to kick off the process. Now you'll see here, I actually set some custom status. Um, this is a feature in Dapper Workflows in the context object, so that when I'm pulling the status, I get more clear picture of where this particular workflow is in the process, right? So I might wanna set a custom status if I'm like waiting 30 days for the trial to complete, right? Because every time I pull it, it's gonna be processing. But if I didn't have a custom status, I might not actually know which state the workflow is in. So I'm not gonna go through like this entire thing end to end, but I, let's just talk through the business context, right? So I'm essentially calling my first activity, which is going to check inventory. So I'm just gonna go out, I'm gonna hit a state store using the Dapper API, and I'm gonna say, is there enough inventory to fulfill this order that was requested? Um, it's going to return to me an inventory result, which basically is a Boolean valuable value. Is there inventory to fulfill this order? Is there not? And what's interesting here is that if there's not enough inventory available, this shows you one of the paths the workflow could, could potentially take, right? Because there's not enough inventory, there's no reason to execute any more activities. Instead, I'm going to set the custom status and then return a result. 
So that's how the, the um, like you'll see when I first started working with this, I kind of expected like, oh, workouts, like the workflow is terminated, right? Like it didn't finish, but it did because I returned a checkout result. I just returned a result that the customer not, might not be as happy with because they really wanted that order. Um, if it does fulfill that particular step, then I'm basically going to create a payment request. So just think of this as me saying, what's the total amount that I need to charge the customer for this particular order? And I'm gonna call that payment activity, right? Process payment. Now, what's interesting about this, and I'll show you an example of this activity, just so you can kind of see what's going on in one of the particular activities. I'm making a service to service call to another application called the payment service. So we talked about Dapper's APIs, right? I can use service invocation, I can use PubSub, I can use state. And this is a good example of orchestrating across multiple services, right? I don't want to create a big monolithic application that's running and executing every single thing and piece of business logic that my workflow needs. So if we take a look at my, payment, my process payment activity, it receives a payment request, which is essentially, here's the order ID, here's how much to charge, here's the name of the user, and then it turn, returns a payment response, which is actually going to be, was this payment uh, you know, successful or unsuccessful? So if we take a look here, um, the thing that I really want to highlight is that I'm making this call called invoke client post as JSON async. And what that's doing is using that Dapper client to call my service with app ID payment at the API Stripe payment method. So I'm using service to service invocation. And as mentioned, we went through this yesterday in a session. So if you want to learn more about service invocation specifically, check it out. But what I get with this is automatic retry policies, right? I can set a, a custom circuit breaking pattern. I get MTLS to the other service. Um, all that's handled on behalf of uh, my application by Dapper. So if the, uh, if the other service returns a success code, I will obviously process the payment, that the payment was successful, and if not, I'll return a 500. Now, how does the workflow know if this failed or not? Well, like I said, I wanna return that the, uh, like I wanna wrap this in a try catch, right? Because if there's an error that happens in a particular activity, I wanna surface that up to the orchestration um, of the workflow in order to mitigate for that, right? Okay, cool. The last thing I wanna call out here is the decrement of inventory. So, and how am I, am I okay on time? We're good on time? Uh, yeah, I'm good on time. So uh, the last thing I want to show is, let's say the payment you know, processes and is successful. Um, and I'm using the Stripe API, by the way. They have a really cool test API that you can actually use to emulate payments. So if you ever need to mock uh, like a payment service, it's great. So just want to call that out. Um, but let's say that I go through and I'm like, OK, process payment, the inventory is all there. Well, unfortunately, they released the KubeCon tickets and everybody went to buy them, right? This just happened to me for like ACL or think you're like Taylor Swift tickets, right? Maybe it was there before you finished checkout. Then it goes back and tries to decrement and it's like, oop, your ticket actually got sold and purchased by somebody else, right? So it's eventually consistent. It's not necessarily gonna be, that inventory might not be there by the time you actually finish executing the, uh, the workflow. So if that inventory is no longer there, um, which we check by saying, uh, you know, let's, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong part here. Where is it? Oh, here we go. If I go to update the inventory and it's like, oh no, that stock's no longer there, well, I've already taken payment, right? So I have to do a compensating transaction. So in my workflow, I can actually do that, right? I can say, hey, um, in my update inventory activity, which we can take a quick look at, I can see here that, oh no, I tried to go, I got the state from the state store that Dapper, once again, Dapper provides to me. Didn't have to put any Redis code in here, but I'm calling a Redis state store. And I can say, hey, um, there's actually no more order quantity to fulfill this order. So unfortunately, once again, very sad for the user, but at least we want to refund their payment, right? We don't want to keep their money. So we will do a compensating transaction by calling another activity called refund payment. So what that's going to do is basically go take a compensating action, refund the payment, and essentially tell the user, I'm sorry, your payment was refunded. There's no longer inventory for um, the order that you made. And ultimately, the goal is we've returned checkout result every time, but it never processed. And in this case, when I get to the very end, I've updated the inventory. Everything's good to go. I'm going to return it as a succeed. So do you all want to see? I'm going to do four little examples of different ways through this workflow and kind of what the results look like. Does that sound good? OK, awesome. So give me just one second here. And we will kick off the application. So we're going to kick this off the exact same way we kicked off the previous application. Uh, the one thing I will say, keep in mind, I already have the payment service running. So just imagine in the background, right, this microservice was already kicked off using Dapper. It has a Dapper sidecar. It's running. We don't really, this is out of scope for the session, but I just wanted to let you know, it is making that service to service call to the payment service. Um, another thing I'll show you really quickly is the inventory database, right? So, oh, thank you, bigger. 
So here you can see a local Redis instance that Dapper creates for me uh, because I used the Dapper CLI. So essentially when you use Dapper locally, you get some built-in um, components you can use for state and pub sub. So I just wanted to kind of showcase when I'm going and checking against inventory, it is literally calling um, and a state API and hitting this local Redis instance to say, hey, how many tickets are available for DapperCon? There's 100. If, they need, if it needs to decrement that, it will. And if, um, you know, if there's not enough inventory, this is what's driving that. Okay, cool. So let's kick off the checkout service. Um, it's the last piece in this puzzle. So I'm gonna do a Dapper run. I'm gonna give the app ID of the checkout service. I'm telling, once again, telling my, um, my Dapper sidecar that the app's running on port 5000 and that uh, telling my application that Dapper is running on 3500. Okay. Okay, everything's good, right? We're, we're halfway there, we have half the battle. Okay, so does it make a little bit more sense now when you see the app say the sidecar work streaming has been established, right? That's that gRPC stream. Um, and you'll see that a lot of these, um, the, the Dapper work, Work, the Dapper sidecar logs make a little bit more sense because the Dapper engine has started and we know that's really what's driving the scheduling and execution of these activities within our workflow. So I'm gonna kick off my workflow now. And how am I gonna do that, right? I'm gonna post um, to the checkout workflow with an instance ID and a payload. So in this case, uh, think of fail checkout as just an easy way for my demo to essentially pass in either valid credit card to charge or an invalid credit card to charge. Um, but the main thing is, uh, my name is Kindle, this is my email, and I'm in order 20 KubeCon tickets. Now, hopefully, if I run this and everything's successful, it'll go all the way through, and we'll take a look at what that status looks like as it's progressing. So, y'all ready to kick it off? Can I get a woo? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm kicking it off. We get the instance ID. So what I want us to do is start pulling. So the first thing that we see is that it's running, and you can see it's checking product inventory. So the custom status is gonna to continue to get updated as we make progress in the workflow. So now it's processing payment, that's great. I actually put some sleep in here just so like I could simulate that you could see the statuses. So it should process for about 10 seconds, and the checkout's completed. Okay, awesome. So throughout that entire workflow process, I knew exactly what step was being executed. Um, I knew that the checkout was completed. And what's really cool about this is um, you know, I don't have to, and I can see my output, right? So uh, yeah, it's pretty nice. And what's, I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but I do wanna show you, I talked about this, um, this state that's being stored by the Dapper engine in order to replay this. It's not pretty and we're not gonna dive into it, but I'm gonna show you it's there, right? So let's take a look. You can see here um, that we have the hello, we have the hello world and the, the checkout one here, but you can see we're getting activities, we're getting workflows that are being kicked off and essentially that historical state is being saved, right? So if for whatever reason, and I'll show you an example of this, my workflow got killed while it was processing payment, uh, God forbid, we will be able to essentially restart it and I'm not gonna have to re-execute it, right? It's gonna pick, off where it pick up where it was, right? It's gonna replay all the activities that already happened and continue through to complete the process. Okay, awesome. So now let's just take a different uh, flow through the workflow, right? So instead of a successful payment, we're just gonna make uh, the payment unsuccessful. And all we should see is that it gets to processing payment and then the status of the workflow will still be completed, but it will be with, you know, payment failed, uh, your order wasn't processed. So let's take a look at uh, what that looks like. So let's get the status here. Oop, I've done that literally 800 times. So we're gonna send the status. It's payment processing. Let's see how far we get before we get a failure result. Payment failed, right? So my custom status is payment failed. Um, and we can see that essentially the workflow is still completed, but at least we know why it failed. And that's because the, uh, the payment couldn't successfully be executed. The card was declined. And you'll see here, we have a lot of logs coming out of both my application and the Dapper sidecar. So I'm basically saying, hey, receive this order for 20 KubeCon tickets. I found 80 of them in inventory, great, let's move forward. And then essentially I'm like, oh no, an error occurred, my card was actually declined. So I'm actually getting that error back that my card was declined and telling the user that the payment processing failed. Um, another thing to, that's, that I think personally is really cool and kind of goes into this, this next demo that I wanna call out, is do you see all of these, uh, these reminders? You see that it says reminder in a lot of places, and if I do a control F, you might be able to see it highlighted. So essentially what happens is, if you think about my workflow engine, it's going to be 
calling out to my application saying, hey, run this workflow, run this activity. Well, what happens if that activity goes down, right? How does the workflow engine know that it was unsuccessful? And it's because this reminder is running. So if the reminder is not canceled by the engine, it means that they, it never received a response that it expected. So this is how you get that durability, right? Is essentially, hey, this, this reminder still exists. When the workflow engine comes back up or when your app comes back up, that reminder is gonna fire, letting it know it needs to complete the workflow. So that's actually what's happening there. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens if I just burn the world down and kill the app and kill the sidecar in the middle of the workflow. Once again, everything's been good so far, so if this one doesn't work out, we'll just take it as an L and we'll move forward, because it's been pretty good so far. So give me just one second here. I'm gonna clear out this screen so you can see what's going on. Actually, no, I'm not gonna clear it out because I'm gonna kill this, okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna kick off a new workflow and I'm gonna change the payload just to kind of keep things interesting. So we'll change it to Alice. Um, I don't know any, but it seems like a good name. And, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so I'm gonna kick this off and then I'm gonna kill the workflow. Does that sound good? Okay, so let's send a request. And then I'm just gonna control C this baby, okay? Okay, so we can see it did find 80 KubeCon tickets in inventory, um, and then I just killed the Dapper engine and I killed my app. So obviously this workflow cannot functionally be running, right? It'd be impossible. If I try to go get the state, um, it's obviously gonna return an error because, once again, done that so many times. If I tried to, uh, to retrieve this, it's gonna say the connection was rejected, right? That app isn't running, there's nothing for me to, to post or get. Okay. Do I want to kick it off again and see if we can hit the status and get a completed workflow? That would be kind of cool, I think. So let's do that. Let's rerun this. Okay, so I'm not going to touch anything. What's happening right now is that that replay state and that reminder are essentially telling the workflow to continue running. So did you see I didn't re-hit anything? Um, and now what's happening is that state's being replayed from that Redis state store, and all of a sudden I can go here and hit that status. And once again, like I said, I didn't re-trigger it, right? I didn't say, hey, rerun this, it went down. And bada bing, right? Payment failed, which we expected, um, but the workflow completed, and that's really what's important. So the last thing that I wanna show you is, I've, we've talked about workflows, and it's like, why dapper, right? Like, why dapper workflows? There's other technologies out there that do this. Um, I don't necessarily know what the value proposition here is, and it's like looking at dapper as a bigger picture, right? I hit a service endpoint, I used state, I didn't codify anything about Redis in my application, very streamlined code, and in addition, I get distributed tracing. So I didn't configure anything, right? I didn't deploy Zipkin, I didn't deploy any type of external tracing engine, um, but using OpenTelemetry, Dapper actually has OpenTelemetry instantiated as part of this workflow. And so I can actually move over to Zipkin, and I'll do that here. Um, and once again, I didn't send anything up. This is like nothing was done for me to do this. So let's refresh this. I'm gonna hit here, and all of a sudden, oh wow, like we can actually see all three of the apps that were running. And we can, and what we would see typically if they were still running is we'd see the actual, ugh, when I zoom in, it's actually getting smaller, so. Oh, there we go, you can actually see a couple. I don't know if you saw them, but you see lines moving where it's like making a request. So that's replaying the request from the past 15 minutes. So I see my services here. And what's really cool is I can actually look at the traces. So let's run a query and we can see the different workflows and we can see the activities actually going through the process, right? So when it completes successfully, I'm going through six different activities. So I have six spans and we can see a couple calls that I've obviously not made it all the way through the workflow. So I can actually take a look here, click show, and without doing anything, I can see a complete trace of my entire workflow end to end. I can see when it started, I can troubleshoot if there's uh, latency in a particular activity. Um, and like I said, what's really nice about this is it's all done for me. So Dapper provides a lot out of the box that makes building these applications a lot simpler than if you were to try to do it you know, without any help or without this runtime, essentially. So I think we have just enough time to close it out, right? At 4.05 plus 40 minutes. Yeah, I think we have a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, let's, let's address this question. So, I mean, the way 
that part what Flows has written is they're really developer focused, they're code first. Because uh, you can, and, I mean, workflow is a long, long history. I mean, it's a 40 year old technology in many, many ways. And you, know, you can take it away back to the 90s and things like this. And there's been many, many workflow engines. But a lot of the kind of more recent workflow engines have been very developer focused. So you, know, you can be a developer first, develop, uh, developer first paradigm of how you write code like that. And, and, and that's really where we're taking what DevOps. Eventually, will there be a declarative format on top of this? For certain, yes. There just isn't one there today. Uh, but a lot of workflow engines started from a declarative only format. And that was OK if you wanted to create visual tools, but it wasn't that developer friendly in some ways because it wasn't a native programming language. Whereas you know, what we see now is that you really were going to satisfy both worlds around those, you know, the graphical, business orientated, easy to talk about, but at the same time, developer orientated those two. So the answer to your question is, yes, there will be a declarative format. We will certainly go. In fact, there's a, there's a standards body inside CNCF that's driving exactly that. And we're working very closely with them. Um, but where we've started today is actually we're starting with a, de a developer focused mentality uh, approach to this. And, and that makes it really good for developers to think about the logic um, and how they write their code. Yeah, I mean, you could have that form of uh, declarative model put on top of this all. Yes, I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking some existing BPM model and, and mapping it down to this code. Um, there are many. Uh, declarative formats around this. It's just it's, it's not there today. Um, could it be there? Totally. Um, but say the developer focused approach on this. And if you look at you know, a lot of the other uh, more recent uh, engines around there, workflow engines, they, they kind of follow a similar model around that, you know, where they have a developer focus on them and not just purely a declarative only one. So I think, can I, do you mind if I yeah, yeah. jump in at all? So I think you're like, you're thinking right, right? There's different personas though. So we wouldn't go to a business administrator and say, hey, use Dapper to write your workflows, right? We're talking about people who are already building distributed applications that are using PubSub and state management, right? And we're coordinating communication across these things. So we're very much focused on large scale, scale distributed application developers that need to coordinate logic across a series of services. But 100%, there's other, there's other great tools out there that provide the ability for like the citizen developers. And we will eventually potentially get there. Um, but I think our audience is a little bit different from a target perspective. Yeah. And, and kind of just building on that thing, the, the premise of Dapper as a project all up is for developers to build applications. And, it's, and what happens today is you get very isolated viewpoints. You get people who just build a workflow engine. You get people who just build some state management. You get people who just build a messaging service. The Dapper project is actually very encompassing where it covers messaging and event-driven architectures. Uh, it covers state management. It covers secrets management and, and many of those things. And, and when you combine those together, you actually end up with a, a very complete platform to build these things. And so I think that's one of the powerful things about this. Whereas you know, sometimes with, you know, when you just use another workflow engine, you've still got to go up and figure out how you combine that with Kafka because you're doing messaging and bring that all together. And there's not those two. So you know, we look at it from that perspective as well. And, and if you go and look at the Dapper itself, it's also it's designed to be very um, inclusive to existing code. It's very incremental in terms of its adoption. You can just use a little bit of it. It's designed for building into brownfield applications and expanding from there. Um, it's not designed for you know, throw everything away and start again. So that inclusive nature of um, any developers you know, coming out from existing code, building on top of that, and migrating you know, things to run the scale is very much in its paradigm as well. So we think of it in the scope of that as well. Yeah, so I want to be conscientious of the next session. So we'll wrap up now. We're happy to stick around and answer any questions. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, definitely check out the Dapper project. We'd love to see engagement. We have a really active Discord channel, over, over 3,000 members. Um, but also, if you're interested in kind of Dapper uh, running it at scale on Kubernetes, definitely reach out to us at Diagrid, and we'd love to have a conversation. So thank you so much. But well, we still have a little bit of time if there are any questions that people want to ask. Yeah, I think we're out. Oh, oh. Yeah, we're five minutes over. But we yes, but we'll stick around 100%. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we have over 100 components for the different uh, 
So yeah, this is probably one of the areas of context you don't get when the session's a little bit more specific. But yeah, essentially think about state, pub sub, um, all of these have different brokers you can actually bring in and out using a component manifest. So think about it, you know, you're using this API, you're calling just the state endpoint. You could hit Redis, you could hit Azure Storage, you could hit, you know. Uh, MySQL. Yeah, I MySQL, there's, literally, there's, yeah. I don't even know, 20? There's, no, there's over 30 state stores. 30 state stores. So, yeah. No, no code changes required. It's actually, yeah. Actually, just to be clear, that, that, that there is a, a certain subset right now which are actor uh, transactional state stores right now are the ones that have. Oh that. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you want one that's transactional or an act can be used as an actor state store to use with workflows. But if you were just using the state API, um, you can use pretty much anything based on. Yeah. Yeah. 